Matthew chapter 18. This chapter is loaded with good stuff. From talking about right at the beginning who the greatest in the kingdom is. And, and ultimately, Jesus says the greatest in the kingdom are those who have the simplest of hearts in regards to loving people and forgiving and not being arrogant and proud. Coming to God with a simple faith. I don't know about you, but I complicate and mess that up all the time. Anybody else in this room? <laughs> I mess that up. Lord, help me to have a childlike faith. Then he goes on and he talks about uh, temptations to sin that will come. And then he talks about the parable of the lost sheep and how we should do everything we can to go after the one that is wandering from God. And then he takes that a step further and, and, and tells us about the, the, the brother who sins and how we as believers have a responsibility to encourage one another, but in relationship to call one another out. When there's... When, when, not, not when a preference, like you don't need to go to the drummer and say, I don't like the way you drum, okay? That's a preference. Keep that to yourself, okay? But if there's a sin issue that's going on and I have a relationship with this person, Matthew 18 lays out the steps on how to do that and how to do it in a healthy way. You, you keep it between the two of you at first and if they don't respond in regards to sin issues, then you get somebody else to help you and then maybe... You have to get uh, a pastor involved. But you don't just immediately call up the church board and say, did you know that so-and-so is this? There's a process that we encourage people to go through that, that is laid out in Matthew 18. But we're talking here today about marriage. We're talking about relationships that we have. And being healthy, this concept of family matters. We've been going through this series now for a few Weeks We talked about the Sermon on the Mount and, and the instructions that Jesus lays out and how they apply to our lives. We, talk, we talked about how in marriage we, get, we lose the happy in our marriages when we begin to get frustrated by what we once celebrated. Remember those quirky things about your spouse that you used to love and now they annoy you to death, right? And how we used to celebrate those things and now we're frustrated by those and... and we talked about how we lose happy when we, as a team, becomes about me. And the importance of staying in that team mindset. Ephesians 5, 30-33 says, Because we are members of his body, therefore a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself and let his wife see that she respects her husband. Heavenly Father, I pray that your word would speak to our hearts, would quicken us to resolve to follow your ways rather than the pattern of this world. We want to allow your truth to lead us and guide us every day. Thank you, Lord. I love this... Uh, how many of you use the YouVersion Bible app or a Bible app? We'll just say that. You use a digital Bible. You like a digital Bible. Some of you do, okay? Some of you are in straight-up rebellion against that, and Jesus loves you still, and that's okay. No, I'm kidding. I like using the YouVersion Bible app because when I'm driving, I can listen to it, and it reads it to me, and I can actually listen to bigger chunks of the Bible in, in a row like that because when I read, I like to dig into a passage, and I don't always get the big picture. And I've been listening to the book of Proverbs, and it's really been speaking to me a lot in regards, well, a thousand different topics that Proverbs hits on, uh, but there was a couple that really stuck out. Proverbs 13, 18 says, whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame, but whoever heeds correction is honored. Have you ever met somebody who uh, is kind of, has that unteachable mindset? You ever met somebody like that? They don't like sitting under other people's teaching. Uh, they don't like being corrected in any way. Uh, but they're really good at correcting you and pointing out your mistakes. You ever met somebody like that? If you're sitting next to them or married to them, don't look at them right now. Because that could make for a very awkward morning. 
We, we've had those people in our lives where you see, them, you see something go wrong and you're just like, I don't even want to bring this up because I know this is just going to be explosive. You know what I'm talking about? I pray every day, Lord, teach me. Lord, teach me. Help me to be teachable. I love, I love sitting under and listening to other people preach because I love just, okay, God, what can I get from this? You know what I'm talking about? Do you, do you have that yearning in your heart to learn more and grow more every single day? If you don't, you can have that. That's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in our hearts. It makes us teachable. Makes us open to instruction and correction and discipline, which is not a four-letter word. It's a good word. But I believe that the truth of God's word is just as relevant today as it was when it was first penned. Do you believe that this morning, church? A little amen would be good right there, right? Do you believe that this morning, church, that God's word is just as relevant today as it was when it was first written? In fact, I would probably press in and say it's probably more relevant because the, the darker the culture is, the brighter the light shines, right? It's even more necessary for today. But this ability to heed correction is not just, oh yeah, I'm humble, you know, <laughs> and to act arrogant, to act prideful. No matter how much you say it or text it or post it on Facebook, Okay, your actions do speak louder than your words, don't they? And people see us, and, and the people that were around, they're not dumb. They see through the duplicity, and I, I want to be a genuine person. I want to live out my life with, without any hindrances where I'm, where I'm walking in the truth of who God is. I think even that, that prophetic word that was spoken is so relevant to this message. Our actions speak louder than our words. I remember watching some kids a while back fight over a toy. That's not an uncommon thing, is it? Fighting over a toy. One, co one kid has it. The other kid looks at it and says, all these five toys I have isn't, aren't as good as that one toy you have. I want that one too, right? You know what I'm talking about? And what does he do? He goes over, yanks it out of his hand, right? And what's the other kid do? Grabs another toy and whacks him on the head, right? Isn't that how it normally works? Almost... You know, you wouldn't think that adults would ever behave that way. We might not use toys, but we'll use words. Because you'll see in a situation like that, in this particular one with these two kids, they literally escalate to the point where they're yelling at each other. And one says, I hate you. You ever heard kids say that before? And, I mean, it was kind of one of those shocking moments. He said, I hate you. How many times does that happen between parents and a kid? Where they have these conflicts going on and they keep track. Well, you did this to me. Well, you did this to me. And you did this to me. We get this tally sheet going of all these wrongs that have been done. And some of them sins. Some of them just preference. Right? And then we end up, you end up lashing out where you'll hear a kid say, I hate you. You ever known any kid in your life, even if it was you when you were younger, say that to a parent? I know that, uh, that, that roaring up in the heart, that, that overflow of what's happening in a person's heart just comes out of them. We get this pride that stirs up. We get this arrogance. I'm better than you. I deserve more than you. And now I'm going to lash out at you because you're not doing what I expect you to do. Behaving how I expect you to behave. And it comes out sideways in some really mean words. When you think about the words that come out of your mouth, are they encouraging words? Are you, do you speak life to people? If you were to rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, of, of 1 being um, speaking the lies of the devil, let's just go with that, <laughs> and 10 being God speaking life and beauty over you, where do you fall on that scale? Like, well, maybe I speak a kind of, kind of negative. No, I try to really be positive. If you were to be honest in, in examining yourselves, because this is one, one of the things that we said is, you lose happy when we don't examine ourselves, right? Where would you fall on that scale? And it's not to beat yourself up, it's to be honest. Yeah, I tend to be negative. Or, no, I really try to be positive. And I'm not just to, talking like crazy, ridiculous positive, you know, like overly bubbly, because we all kind of hate those people, don't we? Just kidding, come on. 
Uh, I'm talking, you know, just genuinely positive, caring and concerned for others. Proverbs 10.21, the lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of sense. The lips of the righteous nourish many. When Would you consider, okay, I'm trying to line my life up with being a righteous person, with trying to honor God and speak life into people whenever I talk. Is that how you engage with people? I want to encourage you in that. There's a couple ways, I'll just buzz through these things, five ways to stir conflict and die for lack of sense, just to kind of build it into that scripture verse. Five ways to stir conflict and die for lack of sense. Number one is just to go around gossiping about people. We all, it, it, seem, it seems so many people love doing it, and nobody likes hearing that it's being done about them, right? So gossip is one way to have people not want to be around you, not want to talk with you. Because I know that if you're talking about, if you're doing gossip with them, what are you going to probably do when, when, when you leave that scene? They're going to gossip about you now, aren't they? The second one is judging. We usually judge harshest in areas that we struggle with the most. Do you believe they're doing this or believe they're doing that? Oftentimes, that's something that we ourselves are struggling with. Negativity. I remember talking with someone that uh, specific, it was, it was a Monday. Now, I know a lot of people don't like Mondays, but I said, man, aren't you, ha- aren't you excited it's a Monday? I'm like, no, it's a Monday. And just that everything that come out of their mouth was just negative. Like, oh, you don't like being around people that are just always negative. Complaining. Ever been, a, been around a complainer? All they ever do is whine and moan. It seems like a national pastime, doesn't it? Especially in regards to like the Vikings or something. I'm actually, I'm actually happy about the game tonight because I don't have to be stressed about how it's going to feel when the Vikings lose. So I'm actually looking forward to the game tonight. <laughs> okay. Finally, number five is excuses. Being a blame thrower. Well, it's not my fault, it's their fault. It's not my fault that I don't ever have money, it's somebody else's fault. It's not my fault that I can't ever show up on time, it's somebody else's fault. It's my kid's fault, or oh, it's my husband's fault, or whatever. We blame, and we blame, and we blame why we couldn't get the task done at work. And those things can wear on people. I just want to encourage you, if you want people to be around you, start doing the opposite. Start taking responsibility for your actions. Stop complaining and start uh, speaking life in a situation. Stop being negative. Stop just running around judging people all the time. Stop gossiping. Amen? I'm with you, but I want to be around a person that that does the opposite of these things. And is authentic, is honest, has integrity, and loves people. Proverbs 10, 11 to 12 says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over wrongs. All wrongs, in fact, it says. That's a, that's a loaded passage right there. Now, you read that in the context of Matthew 18, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of a, this bigger picture concept that Jesus is teaching us, that, that we need to address sin issues that come up in love, in that, in, that, in that balance of grace and truth. We need to address things, especially with people who you have a relationship with. If you're, you know, in your, in your marriage or in your parenting, those things need to be addressed, but done in a healthy context. My kids were cleaning the house the other day, Yes, kids do clean houses sometimes. Uh, it can happen. <laughs> Who has their kids clean? Like, you're, you're teaching your kids to clean. Praise the Lord, thank you for you, okay? Uh, one day they'll actually move out and be mature, responsible people <laughs> because you made them clean the toilet, right? Um, <clears throat> my kids were cleaning, and actually in the process of cleaning, they started to bicker and fight back and forth. And not like your kids would ever do that, but as the father watching the situation, I stepped in, and I'm like, what are you guys doing? And uh, just <laughs> tried to stir the conversation a little bit, uh, just from kind of the outside perspective, and said, guys, you guys are on the same team. What is the ultimate goal here? Trying to get the house clean, right? So why are you fighting over 
who does what and how it gets done. And even, you see this within church. So many times there's, there's bickering between people because we're losing focus from what the genuine purpose of the church is, and that is to focus on what? To focus on Jesus, not a stool, okay? Jesus, right? And when I'm focused on Jesus and what he's doing, do I have time for the petty bickering? No. So I encourage them, uh, hey, you're going to make mistakes as you're cleaning. You're going to have, you're going to, you're going to have troubles along the way, but we're on the same team. Every one of us in here, we're on the same team. Let's work together. As a, as a married couple, you're on the same team. Instead of fighting against each other, fight with each other to achieve the goals. Which would include, hey, I'm, when you mess up, say sorry. When, 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 you, when they ask for forgiveness, you give it. Amen? Well, half of you, maybe a few of you believe that. <laughs> if you mess up, say I'm sorry. Amen? Okay. If they say I'm sorry, give forgiveness. Amen? Okay, a few more of you believe it that time. Is that one of these things that, that I believe is that if you're really wishing someone well, it's hard to judge them at the same time. In fact, I would, I would say that it's almost impossible to wish somebody good. Like, Phil, I want to see you succeed. You know, so I can't sit here and judge you in the process of doing that. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to speak life into you. The, those kind of things, that, that mutual give and take relationship. And we as, as brothers and sisters in Christ should be striving towards these things. On the, on the reverse, if you're hating on someone, if you have someone, in, if, I, if I were to say, who in your life right now do you hate or have a severe disregard for, I would ask you, what does that say about your heart? What does that say about your relationship with God? Could I press in so much to say, maybe you don't love God very much if you're going around hating on people. Ooh, pastor, you can't say that. You can't say that. Actually, we can. Because God says it right here in John, 1 John 4.20. If anyone says, I love God, and hates or works against his Christian brother, he is a what? A liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Jesus is calling us out on our attitude towards people. Are people going to hurt you? Yes. We'll try that again. Are people going to hurt you? Yes. Do you have to be hurt in the process of people trying that? No, you don't. You know, people are going to try all kinds of things to put you down and tear you down. But you don't have to receive that. I remember a few years back, uh, Mel and I have been married now for almost 19 years, which is crazy. I used to think people, anybody married over 12 years was like ancient. <laughs> now it's been 19 years, like, and uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But probably 10 years or so ago, we had that, that you know, that kind of seven-year itch where things are just really struggling. And we, and we had, and I'm not saying it's perfect now, but we've had our struggles in our relationship. I remember getting so mad in an, in an argument that we were having. We were like, well, my arrogance and pride was welling up against, she's never arrogant or prideful, so uh, it was just me. It was a one-sided deal, I'm sure, um, but I got so angry that I walked away from the situation, you know, gently shut the door, right, <laughs> and walked over to the wall and literally just hit the wall and put a hole in the wall, and immediately I had this just flood of emotion come over like, oh no, what did I just do? couple things. One, my hand hurts really bad right now, right? Two, now I got to fix this wall, right? And then three, now I need to go apologize to my wife because I just hurt her emotionally. And, and, and I've never hit my wife. Don't take it that way. But just the, the emotions of disrespect and disregard. And we, and we, uh, we made up after that. And as a good married couple, we... 
Um, we have enjoyed our marriage in many ways. I love my wife. But there's times when we hold those things against each other. We keep these tally sheets against each other, don't we? Well, you did this to me. Well, you did this to me. We go back and forth. And I would say this. We lose our happy when debtors become collectors. When we start keeping those tally sheets, well, you owe me, you owe me, you owe me, and now I'm going to collect. And now I'm going to hold it over you. Now I'm going to beat you up with that. We read in, in Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21, it says, Peter came, he came up to Jesus, and he said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And you can hear it in, almost in, in, in Peter's voice, just kind of this arrogance. It's like, yeah, I'm good, because I'm going to forgive seven times. But Jesus, knowing this, he says to him, I did not say to you seven times, but 77 times. In other words, Jesus is saying, in a better translation, would say seven times 70. In other words, you take the number of perfection, seven, and you multiply it by a crazy number. You should just keep forgiving, is what he's saying, over and over and over. Now, Phil, I'm going to pick on you again today, right? You just sat there and you're wearing a nice blue shirt. If, if Phil comes up and hits me, what am I going to do? Probably fall to the ground and cry, right? No, it's going to hurt. Phil's a tough guy, right? Am I going to forgive him? And this is where you say yes. Yes, okay, I'm going to forgive him, right? If he hits me again, am I going to forgive him? Yes, am I going to keep standing by him? Probably not, right? Okay, forgiving doesn't necessarily mean forgetting. It means I'm not going to hold it over you. I'm not going to let it in bondage me to a hatred towards you, but it doesn't mean I can't sell health, set healthy boundaries, okay? Phil's a great guy, so I'm not going to try to avoid him like that, but if anybody's hurting you, you need to set boundaries. But for your own freedom, for your own health, and your own relationship with God, we need to forgive, amen? We need to forgive. And we'll unpack that a little bit more because the Bible is quite clear about that. Forgive as many times as it takes for you to be free. And it is not contingent upon them asking for forgiveness, is it? Regardless of whether they want you to forgive them or not, you forgive them. So, we have, when it comes to judging, when it comes to forgiving or not forgiving, when it comes to holding these tally sheets of debt, we, we oftentimes make reference, if you've ever seen the picture of the, the lady, the judge, that has a blindfold on and has a scale in her hand. You know what I'm talking about, that picture? You oftentimes see it, see it in statues at courthouses and stuff. And, and a scale is often used to weigh in judging. And we have here a scale that I, I stole from the food shelf for a little bit. Um, but this scale, there's a couple things I can do with this. One of the things that I've been encouraging through this entire series is we have a responsibility, if we want to make our relationships better, to examine ourselves, which means with this scale, what do I do? I stand on it. I examine myself. Wow, I need to lose a few pounds, right? <laughs> Whatever it might be, right? Uh, so we, we examine ourselves. Another thing we can do, and this is the, the power of the gospel message, is that when I've examined myself and I'm like, wow, I can't, there's a, there's a burden there that I can't deal with on my own. I cannot, it's too overwhelming that I can give it over to Jesus and he takes that burden away. And that's where we invite Jesus. But Jesus, Jesus isn't weighed by the scale because Jesus is perfect. So he doesn't stand on the scale. The scale because Jesus fulfilled the law, the scale weighs, is weighed itself. The law is weighed against Jesus. Completely different. And this is why Jesus says, my burden is light. My yoke is easy to carry. Because we operate through the fulfilled law, we operate in grace and truth. And that's a, that's a hard message to grab sometimes. But instead, what oftentimes we do is we take this scale and we start using it against other people. Rather than examining ourselves or giving it over to Jesus, we start going up to people that hurt us and we start using it against them. Now, if I were to take this 
So I'm going to pick on Brian now, because you're behind Phil, uh, right? And I'm going to pretend that Brian, Brian, you did something mean to me. I'm not going to say what it was, but you did it. And then you did it again, and then you did it again, and you did it again. That's mean. You didn't. Brian's a great guy, right? <laughs> uh, but now I take the scale. Those things that other people do to you, do they have any weight to affect your life? They only have as much weight as you af- allow them to affect you. So on, in and of themselves, they're weightless. Until I say, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to screw, I'm going to, why did you do that to me? And you begin to bear weight on that. And I need to go to the gym more, otherwise, so I can get the numbers a little bit higher than maybe five pounds. <laughs> but when we, when we hold on to the things that people do against us, if I squeeze this long enough, what's it going to do? It's going to wear me out, isn't it? I'm going to get tired of this. And it's going to become a burden to me. And many people, if there's anything you get from the message today, is you need to take the scale and all the pain that people have caused and, and, and literally just give it over to Jesus. Jesus, help me forgive them. And I know that there's people in here that you've been hurt bad. Somebody has done, done something to you that you, like, I've heard people say this, I could never forgive that. That is a dangerous, dangerous statement. I could never forgive that. We'll look at what happens when that takes place. As we continue to read here, verse 23 says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. This is God and his connection with us. So when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. In other words, it was a burden so high It could not be paid on its own. It was a debt so high. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children, all that he had, and payment be made. And I want to say this. Your sin and your, um, that you have committed and the the things that you hold against other people incurs on you something that does not just affect you, it affects your whole family. And this is why we surrender our hearts to Jesus. And this is why we forgive other people. Because when you get locked in a prison, it locks your family there. Amen? So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. That statement right there is very revealing of this man's heart. This is the position of religion. God, I offended you, but I'll make it right by paying it all back. And God's like, No, that's not how it works. I paid it for you. You don't need to pay it back now. You see the the, the difference in that? He paid it. He canceled it. So verse 27, out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. In other words, Jesus is involved in the picture here. But when that servant went out, once again, it's it's this mindset of religion that we carry into our marriages We carry into into our relationships. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Everybody say peanuts. Peanuts. In comparison to what the king forgave him, this was peanuts. It was almost nothing. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. Now, this guy might get a bad rap because why, what, what's a reason that maybe the guy was beating up his fellow servant for the money? Once again, religion. He maybe wanted to get the money so he could go and pay back his master. So he still had this mindset like, there's no way I could be forgiven. There's no way I could be forgiven. I just need to go beat up other people and collect from them so I can go pay the master. And it's a backwards mindset. Instead of walking in the, thank you, king, for forgiving me, I'm going to walk in that and forgive others, there was this disconnect. There's no way he could have forgiven me. I'm too messed up. I've hurt too many people. I'm just going to keep hurting people. You see where that breaks down? See where that prison and snares? The verse, I'll say this, if you insist in living in a system of payback, i got to pay God back, you will always be the one that is punished. 
and the one that is worn out and has a burden on your heart. Verse Verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. See, when you hold unforgiveness in your heart, when you, when you try and uh, hold these things against other people instead of forgiving them, the people around you see, don't, you, don't we? We see people that are walking around in bitterness, and we, oftentimes we want to avoid them. It says, when the master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should, you, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? In other words, you should have forgiven him that debt as well, just like I forgave you. You remember in Matthew chapter 6, who knows the Lord's Prayer? Maybe you couldn't quote it right now, but the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? It says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then you go, skip on over to verse 14 and 15. It says, if you don't, Jesus says this, if you don't forgive men their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive you of your sins. Ouch. And yet at the same time, praise the Lord, because if I do forgive other people, he forgives me. Right? So it goes both ways. Ultimately, which direction? Like, I want to hold on to this. Stop talking about this pastor because i want to hold on to my unforgiveness then you're in trouble but if you're willing to say okay pastor i'll let it go okay i'll obey god's word i'll heed discipline and correction i want to be teachable there is such great hope for you it's your choice amen oh man it's a good choice too i don't know about you but i need a lot of grace i need a lot of mercy so i'm going to give a lot of grace and I'm going to give a lot of mercy. Amen? The thing is, if you recognize, in or, if I take up this scale, and I start bringing this back over to Brian and Phil, and I start holding things against them right now, or even choking them with this thing, what have I just done in order to do that? I've just taken this off of Jesus, haven't I? I've, t I've taken this away from him, and I've tried to take it up myself again. And this is not a scale that any of us can bear. There is only one judge. And who is that? That is Jesus. And praise the Lord, he doesn't judge like we do. So do we, walk, do we, do we preach the truth? Absolutely. Do we live by the truth? Absolutely. And we're going to walk in so much grace. And we're going to trust God in the process. Romans 13 uh, well, no, let's, let's finish up that um, verse 34. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he paid all his debt. This is that concept that if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. If you choose not to forgive, all that debt comes back on you. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It comes back to that heart condition. Romans 13, 8 says, Let no debt remain unstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. I just want to encourage you that as Christians, rather than going around angry at one another, we can walk in the love that he has. We can walk in being on the same team and encouraging one another because we're going to mess up. I promise you all mess up as being a pastor. Will you have grace and mercy for me? When you mess up, do you hope that we Give grace and mercy to encourage one another, spur one another on. That's what I get excited about as a church that works together to introduce people to Jesus and the option that he has. Praise the Lord for this. What hope and what joy. I get excited just thinking about, man, when I bring someone to Jesus, they don't have to hold this anymore against people. They don't have to even stand on it anymore and feel all those inadequacies. Instead, how is it that you get to heaven? By your good deeds? No. By standing next to this guy. I'm with, I'm, I'm with this guy. Everywhere I go, I'm with this guy. That's how I want to live my life. Instructed by God's word, walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, and walking in his grace and forgiveness. I have been forgiven by the king. 
Anybody else in here, you've been forgiven by the king. Praise the Lord. Forgiven by the king. I am not going to beat other people up over peanuts. First John, First John 4.20 again. If anyone says, I love God and hates or works against his, his Christian brother or sister, he's a liar. The one who does not love his brother whom he's seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. For whatever reason, this word for this day, Lord, you've got plans so much bigger than ours, so much more freeing than ours, much more beautiful. And Lord, I pray that today we would be a people that would put down our anger, put down our bitterness, put down our desire for revenge, put down our pride, and put down the hurts that other people have caused against us. Lord, that we would seek to reconcile relationships, that we would seek to set healthy boundaries where they're needed, but Lord, that we would not carry around the debts of other people and be collectors of those things. If you're here and this morning the Holy Spirit has put even a situation in your heart that you've been holding against someone. You've been beating someone up with maybe even just your mind. You want to hurt them. I can think of even situations. Would you just be so honest to say, God, I need your help to forgive. I need your help to let it go. Anybody that just raise your hand and say, that's me, Pastor. I need to let these things go. I've got bitterness in my heart. I want to be teachable. I want my heart to be moldable. I want to, I want to get out of this prison of unforgiveness. There's hands up all over in this room. Thank you for being honest as we come before God. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit right now would begin to speak to these hearts. They come before you in humility. You are God and I am not. Your ways are right and mine are not. Teach me your ways, Lord God. Help me to ask forgiveness in the, t in the situations I need to. Help me to give forgiveness in every situation, every time. Help me to understand healthy boundaries. Help me to cheer people on instead of beat them up. In fact, say that with me. Lord, Help me to cheer people on instead of beat them up. Say that again. Lord, help me to cheer people on instead of beat them up. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to ask one more question before we go this morning. Some of you find yourself standing on this scale with the debt of sin over your life that is too great for you to bear. You know you can't pay it. And Jesus today is offering forgiveness. He's offering to take you off that scale and make you right with the king again. In the first service, we had at least one that, that made this decision to say, today is my day. I'm going to receive the forgiveness and the love that Jesus has to offer me. I'll give my sin over to him to walk in new life. And who here this morning would say that, Pastor, I need to ask Jesus to forgive my sins. If you just slip your hand up, I'd like to make eye contact with you. We're trusting God for good things today. God is so good. If that's not you, if you already have Jesus in your heart, to be praying for those that are, that are at this step in their journey. Jesus, I need you to forgive my sins. Thank you, Lord God. Anybody this morning, you would stand with me. I trust in this service that since nobody raised their hands for that portion, that either you're praying over that and you're wrestling with God in that area, or we all already have. And I want to remind you that as Christians, as a church, we have a responsibility to share this good news with our friends, with our family, with our co-workers, to invite them to hear the good news that Jesus saves, that Jesus forgives, no matter how messed up we are. Share that good news. Amen? Share that good news. So 
with that, I want to send you with this. Lord Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower us, would embolden us, would get us excited about this big debt that's been forgiven in our lives, would help us to take action in the relationships that need mending, and would help us to share this with with everyone we come in contact with. Guess what God did in my life? Let me tell you about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.